listening to Parent Projects. Hey guys, is uh, palliative care or hospice a part of the situation for your family? And specifically, are you dealing with it from some level of a distance? Uh, you're going to want to stick around for today's show. Dr. Yolanda Suarez with Traditions is going to be in studio, and we're going to talk about those things that can help you deal with death from a distance. You're listening to Parent Projects, a family media and technology group production. Now here's your host, Tony Sievers. Hey guys, uh, this week's show uh, is somewhat of a personal touch and we're going to work to get through it. I've got Dr. Yolanda Suarez with Traditions Health. Uh, they are a hospice organization, palliative care organization. She in particular is an expert uh, that has dedicated herself to being able to help those loved ones to help us and to help our loved ones uh, as they face that time of transition in particular. And so uh, for me and my personal family, uh, we had the great opportunity to, to work with Dr. Suarez uh, last month uh, with the passing and the transition of my own sister. So we'll see how today's episode is going to go. There may be a couple of spots that sit within it, uh, but until that does happen, Dr. Suarez, Thanks. Welcome to the show. And thank, I, so much to thank you for, but we'll start with today. Thanks for being here. Hi, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited that you asked me to be here. <laughs> well, you're, uh, the calm, the dignity that you provided, uh, you, the information you provided to us, it was, it was a different tone. And we, you know, in our in our, uh, for some, it's a parent project. For us and our family, my parent project was also seeing my parents have to deal with, with, um, with burying one of my siblings and watching one of my 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 only sibling pass. That creates a lot of the parent projects there. That's all a part of this, and uh, the dignity that good palliative care, uh, informative, uh, and understanding what's going on in that in hospice, I think, was really key to us being able to say goodbye in a way that will help my family stay healthy. Uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, it helps us recover and just to deal with loss, which is hard in the first place. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Yeah. As you, um, you know, I've, I've, I've asked you this a, a couple of different times, but I think it's a great story to hear and understanding. Uh, it is a tough thing to deal with. Death is rough. Families coming in from all over, all the complexities of that situation. What gets you, Dr. Suarez, to put your life to this? How did you how did you come into palliative care, hospice care? How did you, this come to be the mark in your calling? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that I'm asked repeatedly. And um, it's, it's really hard to say how people are led to a certain type of work. But for me, um, I didn't get any exposure to end of life care in medical school or residency. I had no idea what hospice was and all of our patients died in the hospital. It's all except for one. And I wrote a prescription for morphine um, at the um, request of my attending and the patient went home. And when I asked him, how is this patient going to be taken care of at home? He just kind of shrugged and didn't say anything. And so for me, patients always died in the hospital. And if they went home, it was a mystery what happened. And then towards the end of my residency, we had a hospice, a local hospice. I did my residency in, in Los Angeles um, through USC. And there was a, an organization that came to speak to us. Uh, it was a hospice organization. And that was the aha moment for me. And that was, that was the answer I was looking for. And that was very, um, yeah, and that's cool. really the beginning of my, my work. When, uh, so as, a, as a, a doctor that starts getting that your, your eyes are always to the aha moment, you see that, oh yeah, there's, a, there's probably humanity. It, had there, at that point in time, had you had a family situation? Was it, was it something you could tie in personally to? Or really was it just being able to recognize, wow, we could do better in a healthcare system if we understood this element and, and layered that in? Yeah. How did that unfold for you? So I've been really lucky that my family, um, it's, you know, up until recently, I have a very small family. And so um, 
So thankfully I didn't have anything going on there, but I'm just drawn to people. And I mean, I think medicine to me is, is a puzzle involving people. And, but the most important person is, 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 is the patient and, and understanding the patient, being curious about that person. And I, that was this curiosity about people, I think, is what um, what I think drew me to that. that a lot of what I do is dealing with patient themselves, less so about the medicine, right? I mean, it's it's about understanding the patient, what they want, what their what their priorities are, and that family. And I think that's what I, I love so much about how it gives me the opportunity to to deal with the entire patient as opposed to just their disease. Um, you know, we're past yeah. that we're past the curative space or it's about the patient. Now. And I, that's, um, I think that's what draws me to this. And the opportunity to work in teams is also very appealing because I have, a whole, I have to do it all myself. I have a whole team and, and all of that just comes, comes together. It's really well, important work. And, and the, the mark of, we'll call it, I, I don't know if it's the right term from that, but bed, bedside manner, I think, is a term that I've heard in the past of the doctors use to explain and to the patients what that what that hospice situation or what that looks like. Is there a when family comes in to the situation? And, and I think that's we were talking offline that eventually becomes most hospice or home palliative care that becomes some element. It's to get them home. And so there's probably going to be some inter introduction of, of that. Is there, is there, is there training? Is there special training or, what, or what's the, what's the thoughts that help prepare uh, the physicians and the staff and the team that's there for hospice? Where are they coming from um, when that moment happens as families starting to come back in, everything's now transitioned maybe out of a hospital back into the house and kind of coming through in that day. Well, you know, it's, what, where, where's, where's the, where are you guys coming from? What are the things you guys are seeing, thinking, or, or feeling for? Yeah. So that's a really good question. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of, of training that, that goes into this. I think that some people are better at, at it than others. I think there's only so much you can train people to, um, um, because these are, these are very difficult conversations. And so how do you approach these conversations? And the way that I always approach it is, um, you know, the patient is, is, is in the forefront. I recently had an intern come with me and to, um, to talk to a patient who was in the hospital and who was delirious. And she was surprised that I was going to go talk to the patient. And I thought, well, I, I need to talk to the patient. I need to know what the patient wants. Delirium is not the same as dementia. Delirium, mm -hmm. um, you know, waxes and wanes. And so I the know. important thing is, is who the patient is, what their goals are, what, what is important to that patient? I think that's the key. It's not what's important to me, what's important to the resident. Um, it's what's important to the family. It's what's important to that patient. And, and getting a really good understanding of that will help lead the conversation and bring in the family and discuss, um, discuss that. Because once we have a clear idea of what the patient wants, it's just a, a, a much easier conversation. Yeah, uh, that makes complete sense from that standpoint. I think oftentimes when a family's coming into it, you're looking at more, you, taking that break to focus on you. You kind of have all your baggage that's coming through the door. And and one thing I think I really want to talk about when we get into this next segment after this break is, uh, you know, if you're walking in as a family member, what are healthy things to do walking into that situation? What are what what what, what's right supposed to kind of look like, or maybe not right, because if you've seen one project, it's one project, but what are what what could success look like that would help that situation, that would help those other conversations continue to unfold as the, the medical staff needs to have that with the, the you know, dignified dying that are passing or, uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, after this, this uh, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to sit and talk with Dr. Yolanda Suarez uh, and really talk maybe as family that's coming in from out of town, um, some proper ways that you can step into that and things to think about once you hit the ground. Stay tuned. Hey guys, uh, this is Tony at the Parent Projects Podcast. And if you are powered by coffee the way that I'm powered by coffee, I think you'll appreciate knowing a way that you can help the last lost and least of us that didn't have a great transition. 
You see, the Refuge Coffee Company is a social enterprise operated by Catholic Charities of Central and Northern Arizona, where they use this coffee and this business model to help homeless veterans at the Mana House Transitional Community get back on their feet. Help a veteran turn a handout into a hand up by giving them the opportunity to earn your business. Purchase coffee today at therefugeaz.com. That's the Refuge az.com. If you order six or more bags, shipping will be free. And if you tell them that Parent Project sent you, I'm going to send you a travel coffee mug. Thank you again, and let's get back to the show. We're here today with Dr. Yolanda Suarez, uh, a traditions hospice, uh, played a personal role in our family uh, and many other families uh, across the country. The um, the focus today we're looking at is really that death from a distance. It's this kind of palliative care basics for remote family caregivers in particular. Dr. Suarez, let's, let's talk about the families coming in. Uh, they've gotten that phone call in the middle of the night or whatever it is. You know, it's, uh, hey, your, your mom, your dad, your sister's ready to make some difficult decisions. They're asking for you to come into town. Um, what, what should... What, what is most helpful when family is coming into that situation? You just recently probably transferred back with the, the patients, just moved back into the home. What are some things we should be thinking about? So these are very, sometimes these are very complex cases, Tony. I think that um, death sometimes brings out the best in people, but oftentimes it brings out the worst in people. Um, and there the conflicts can arise. And, but I think the most important thing is there has to be some trust. There has to be a lot of um, trust in the, in the healthcare professional. And so what I try to do is have the family pick one person that will be the spokesperson and that can communicate because it, things can get very muddled if, I talk to one person, uh, the provider, and then I have to talk to another person. Um, it just gets very complex because people hear different things. You may say the same thing to one person, but people's perspectives can be different. And I think, so I think when there's, especially when there's a lot of family members is um, having one person and usually the local person that is um, closest to the, uh, uh, the patient um, who can speak directly with the providers and then have that person communicate it. And the providers, social workers can also help facilitate those conversations so that if there are more family members that want to hear it all at one time, that can be facilitated. Sure, sure. I think the lack of information is probably, or the lack of understanding of a situation is probably the um, the, the biggest obstacle to um or, or causes the greatest amount of conflict. So those that family member that you're looking for to talk to uh, may or may not be a power of attorney or something working there, because at this point in time, you're you're still trying to really work with you're working with the patient directly, right? Usually when when the, when things are kicking off, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Well, you bring up a really good point because one of the key things and a lot of things that um, that we see so often at end of life that hasn't occurred is that the patient has not designated a power of attorney or somebody to speak on their behalf. But oftentimes power of attorneys step in when they're not supposed to. That power of attorney is responsible for the care only when the patient can't make those decisions on, on their own for themselves. But that is, um, so a spokesperson can be different from a power of attorney, obviously, you know, a, a one person who may have knowledge of of healthcare might be a better um, point of contact and uh, resource for the family, and then they can communicate with the um, the person who has been appointed the, the power of attorney at that point. But um, there's also a lot of common misconceptions about hospice that brings on a lot of conflicts within families as well. And so, um, help great tell, <laughs> cue them up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, clarifying some of those and, you know, and demystifying some of those things is also really important. Yeah. And, and is that easily done uh, from that? You, do, will you talk maybe into that one family person to have them distribute that or talk to that information? Is it trying to get people in one place to level set and hear the same thing at the same time? Is there one thing that works better than the other? Is it just yeah. up to family to family? So, I mean, each situation is unique. 
And yeah. some families are very cohesive and you can have that conversation with everybody at one time. And then um, and that works great. Other times that doesn't work so great. Um, but also, you know, there's also medical literacy that we talk about all of the time, and especially with our elders or people who um, who, you know, English is not necessarily their first language. Um, and so being able to communicate that information in a way that everybody can understand is also really challenging. And so when you have somebody that has medical knowledge, that's very helpful. But if you don't, we as providers, that's our responsibility. We have to make yeah. ourselves understood, right? Um, because you want to make sure that everybody understands what's going on so that they have, um, so there's less less confusion and less um, uh, less conflict later on. Yeah. Is there, you know, in, in one, maybe fault in that confusion and conflict uh, time, the less of it you have, the more that kind of heightens awareness and, and things get very, very, you know, difficult. Um, engaging, I think that's one of the first things I know I wanted to try to gauge. And I saw many other people when they first came in, uh, they were trying to gauge as well. How much time do we have here? Is this a, do I, do I have 25 minutes? Do I have, you know, two and a half days? Do I have 25 days? Like how, how long is this going to work through? It seems like families are trying, when family members first come in, it's one thing to do. And it probably helps us gauge what level of conversation we have to have at that time mm -hmm. and, and what's going to pass. Is there something about the, the general setup of hospice, especially at home or powder care at home? Is there something about the setup that can help clue you into where you might be in uh, transition at all? As far as life expectancy, you mean? Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's a topic in and of itself. That's a, that's it really? a really, that's yeah. a really great point though, because uh, it's what we refer to as prognostication. And so some doctors are better at it than others, but um, it's, you know, it's hard to predict because we're not God, but there are certain things that we, we look for. We look for, you know, functional status, disease process. We look for mental status. Um, you know, what brought them to the hospital in the first place. So there's a lot of things that we um, go through and um, I've done this for a long time so I can pretty much gauge um, um, I'm, I'm I can pretty much gauge the life expectancy at that point but if if there is a life-threatening illness and um, there is not much time the the best thing is just to bring family in to have those conversations say this is a good time to come in if you can and um, say goodbye or, you know, come visit. And I think that the earlier, the better, because you don't want to miss that, um, that window of opportunity for somebody yeah. who wants to visit and see their loved one or needs to take care of, of caregiving or of their, you know, their, their assets, their homes, whatever it is that they have to take care of there, there has to be a conversation around that. And, and, um, and when that should happen. Well, you know, key to those conversations from our experience was uh, my sister and and I and I know others that we've seen in hospice situations being able to uh, be in a comfortable spot themselves. When, when, once they came down and and when they were in control and working through that, that allowed the rest of us to kind of gauge those, have those conversations, to work through those conversations, which I think is a huge benefit of why you use hospice and palliative care. It is, it is a huge upside to have resolved uh, or to, you know, to work through those things in a, um, not a hospital environment necessarily. Uh, and it could even have, it's some element, some of it even happened in a hospital environment. Honestly, when you were treating, uh, you know, my sister up at OHSU in Hillsboro, um, I still was able to have, she just had hit a, peace for one of the first times one night that she and I could have great conversations in FaceTime. And I think that's a, that was something that came real valuable. So I would tell the family members that are out there, if, if this is something that uh, they're having a hard time calming into or working through, start seeking this out. If you haven't been presented an organization that can do this, find one, start looking for something. Uh, and I'm really happy. We're really, really happy with traditions. And, uh, and I was hoping kind of between uh, this topic and kind of as we segue into talking about 
uh, maybe what the most common questions are that you hear from everybody when they hit the ground. Mm -hmm. I like to highlight traditions a little bit and show other people what it was that we found and really what could be there. If that's, if that's okay with you, we'll take a break to there. At Traditions Health, enhancing your quality of life is our greatest priority. That's why we pride ourselves on providing top medical professionals, the latest technology, and highest level of care, all to fulfill our healthcare promise to you and your family. This channel features everything you need to know about home health, hospice, and palliative care. From tips on how to live well with a chronic illness, to heartwarming stories about exceptional patient care. Subscribe now to see how we are changing people's lives for the better. Hey guys, we're back and this week we are talking about death from a distance uh, for family caregivers that might have to come into a situation or you're coming back and we're looking specifically at the industries of palliative care and hospice and the impacts they have there. We have with us Dr. Yolanda Suarez, who is the medical director with Transitions. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, she, she works uh, palliative care, geriatrics, Oregon Health Sciences University. Um, you, you've, done, you've done an MBA as well, yes, in and around that. So you're understanding just the complexities of how I think that moves into, into, uh, into medicine as well. What's the business element of that? What is the touch points between where medicine comes in? This is a really, I find it to be a very, very interesting soft touch between sometimes well, it was, I used to think of it as traditional medicine. Maybe they call it alternative medicine. But when you're going home and you're working through some of those things and those touches uh, of just not being in a facility, necessarily being inside a, a hospital, um, and you do, a, you do a great job of that. So, again, that, that's who we've got. We've got uh, Dr. Suarez with us today. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Right. Yeah, so my, my MBA is, in, is it actually it's in healthcare. I mean, I think our – our particular healthcare system is really complex, yeah. and um, understanding that is, is 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 kind of difficult at times, even, even for healthcare providers. Yeah, you know, I, you know it, it is. I, I think not only difficult, but when you look at the fact that generally uh, a single healthcare event could wipe out a family these days, when it comes down to the costs of those things, uh, you know, we we look the. For the first time ever, also we're an aging population globally. For the first time in the history of humankind, the organ health or the uh, uh, the World Health Organization is saying the average human being across the globe can expect to be 65 years of age, uh, and that is, I think, we'll just continue to see that go up with with the introductions of stuff like with medicine and the advancement of medicine. So I, I love that's what you're focusing on. Thank you very much, and I think that. Um, the transition, what I'd really like to get into are, that, man, those common questions. I am sure that we asked and messed it all up coming into it as a family. It's, it's, it's no. we do the best. You guys. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, it, it, the, you're doing the best that you can. There's a lot of complex stuff that's going on. We had a great conversation in the last block. And if you missed it, make sure you go back and you watch that um, and make sure that you're you're, you know, subscribe and if, uh, to the channel, understand this, see the other resources. We're going to post some of the resources that Transitions and Dr. Suarez has provided for us along in show notes and everything down below. So check that out. But if, um, is, if we talked already kind of about what would be great things to know, can I ask what, what are the most common questions? What are the, even if they're not the right questions, what are the most common things that families are looking for when they come into that situation and they're looking at it all happen? Yeah, so we hit a little bit about that um, in the last segment, which is, you know, how how long, you know, how much time do we have with our our, our loved one, my mom? Um, you know, what do I have to do to get ready um, for for sorry, if the patient's coming home uh, from the hospital, what what do I have to do to get ready to you know to bring my my loved one home? And that's a whole other conversation because it's very it's very complex because as we talked about um, you and I um, before, it's um, our our Medicare, which is 
primarily what patients use for hospice care, doesn't cover caregiving, doesn't cover housing. So what happens to somebody like a person who's still working? How do we, how do they take care of their mother and still work? You know, um, how does that happen? Where do they find caregiving and who pays for the caregiving is another, is another option. If they can't bring them home, what what are the options for yeah. for housing and placement? Um, in your sister's case, it was she wanted to come home. She was a very she was she was she made that very clear from the beginning. And so we did what and you know in in your in her situation, she was so fortunate that she had all this loving family that was able to 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 want her to come home and 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 honor her wishes. But not everybody has that. Some people don't have families, um, or the or or. The, the daughter or the son or the only family member is out of state. So how do they negotiate that from far away? Um, you know, hospice has social workers, has, you know, we have, there's a whole team that can help, um, that can help families navigate that system, but it, it, it becomes very complicated. You know, where do you, where do you find those resources? How do you visit facilities from far away? Right. You know, you live in another state how do you know this is the right place for your for your mother your father your aunt um and so those are all very those are questions that we we um we get all of the time um the um you know primarily with with the placement you know what happens afterwards you know who pays for funeral is there are there funds but if there are no funds available for for that how what happens after that um so that's um, that's also very common. The other thing is, um, can I still get medical care while I'm a hospice? What are my options? So, uh, and when when patients are on Medicare, their Medicare benefits cover mostly, you know, their everyday care. Once they're on hospice, their hospice benefit kicks in. So that hospital stay is no longer covered, and so patients, um, the care is just different. It's it's the focus shifts to quality as opposed to preventive and and yeah. life extending. But those are also, you know, can I keep my same medications people come in thinking that we're going to take all their medications off and that's not the case we like patients to take as little medications as possible because it's better for them but um we don't come in and automatically um you know cut cut out everybody's medications well um, I, and i'd say i think a um an eyes wide open moment uh, for me in that is that i i think maybe bef in most of the experiences i'd seen before it was a pretty linear process in, in my sister's case, and I got to imagine other people have that too, it kind of came back and forth. I mean, we, we came home, we had hospice, we ended up having to go back to the hospital in order to make certain adjustments into medications and things like that. Then we came back over to, like there was this, it's a very fluid, it's a fluid situation. And, yeah. and so what you understand yeah. for one day might only work for that day uh, yeah. and, and they can go. With understanding that aspect of, um, like the payer system is what I, you know, we, I, we hear that referred to uh, as, is, uh, is how insurance and actuary kind of impacts how healthcare happens. Uh, are there anybody that you, you guys generally recommend? You, is, is it social workers on side the team that start to explain those things? Do you have recommendations um, yeah. on, on how to understand that aspect? It's, it's, it is really complex. Uh, and we do have social workers that assist with that. The social workers, um, their job is to understand patients' financial um, status, uh, to see what funding is available um, and work within that, um, that capacity. Um, you know, caregivers are extremely important because hospice is not in the home 24 hours a day. It's a, we we're available 24 hours a day, but we're not there. And so caregiving is essential. And so, but how, how do you get caregiving when, you know, for instance, you're far, you're so far away or you don't have the resources. It's, it's quite, quite challenging. And so our social workers can cap tap into some of those resources. There's, there's organizations that, that will help support some of that. I'm involved in a, in a wonderful organization that helps uh, um, hospice patients with wishes, like sort of like gifted wishes. It's called gifted wishes, but it's um, it's like a make a wish for a hospice uh, patient. So, so there's ways that we can um, find, but, but funds are are varied, and so s.gov is a really good primitive site um, for that health. 
Um, because a lot of patients come into this thinking that end of, you know, when they need it, Medicare will pay for housing, they will pay, and it's, it's, that's, that's not the case at all. Medicare pays for medical care, but um, housing, caregiving, that is usually separate. And I think you, we may have had a little bit of a gremlin in the system. Can you give us that website one more time, please? And yeah, it's the cms.gov. Um, let me see if there's a specific. I had written it down somewhere. But um, yeah, so it's the um, cms.gov website. Um, and then you just navigate to um, Medicare fee for service, the site. And um, it, 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 it's pretty easy to read. So it's not, it's, it's made for the public. So um, it's, it's pretty informative. And for patients seeking hospice and palliative care, it'll lead you into the hospice and it, it does a really nice, uh, um, it gives a really nice explanation of what's covered and what's not covered and, and how your regular Medicare uh, benefits work um, and what changes once you're on hospice. Um, and so really the, the key thing when you're on hospice is that you are aware that your Medicare benefits are going to switch. You know, you're no longer going to be, it's not no longer going to pay hospital care. Um, you can still keep your attending. You're, if you're very attached to your primary care provider, you're, you're able to, uh, to keep your primary care provider. And so that's a really important thing for some patients to, to, to know that their doctor can still be involved. And so if patients, for instance, fall in the home and they break their hip or they, they hurt themselves and they're bleeding, we, they can still get care in the emergency room. You know, most of the time hospice has to be involved of some sort, but if they need more care and they choose to receive that care, then they can always come off of hospice to receive that care. So it does, as we talked about before, it's, it's quite yeah. fluid. Yeah. Uh, and some patients um, actually graduate from hospice. They get better and they and they come off care. And so then their Medicare benefits just get right back in. So yeah. you never really lose them if you if you want them. If you come off hospice, they, they come right back on. And I think a, a good thing because the show goes out nationally to think through is you can look through. There, there's a national set, but really state Medicaid systems tend to guide where this is going to go. So make sure you look within your state Medicaid center. Uh, it, for our family, I know we were able to pretty quickly understand what that flow was and how that would go when we had to come out of hospice back in a traditional, uh, particularly because my sister used that Medicaid system. So if your family members on that Medicaid system here in Arizona, we have Altex and we have some other versions of that as well that are specifically set up for seniors, depending on where they may be housed or how that works. Um, state specific look through that cms within your state too uh will will help guide you into what that looks like but it sounds like really your hospice provider state to state should have a good understanding of that and that's part of that that team which i think is one of the last things i was hoping to transition to as we go to close for a family when you're coming into this you are a medical director uh in and involved in it many times you're providing that that medical uh, direction, what what medicines are going to be used as they work through those things. There is an entire uh, spectrum of people, not spectrum, I, even, I mean, there's, there's a, we, we, we had a chart I remember we used to understand everybody that played a role. And there's, there's something like six or seven different roles from social workers to chaplains and others. Um, how is it that all of that stays synchronized with a, how, how do you guys know what's going on from that in case management as far as it, it looks? What what can a family, what should they know and what can we expect from that out of a hospice or palliative care? Yeah, it's like, it's a really good question. So the, the core team members are the medical director, the chaplain or spiritual care coordinator, social worker, and of course the, the nurse case manager. The other services that we provide um, are a health aid that helps with um, some caregiving, uh, bathing, um, you know, some housekeeping, um, and that's that's a very uh, a little little bit of housekeeping, just tidying things up. Um, we can have music therapists, massage therapists as well, and so there's um, additional services. But the four the four people are the nurse, the doctor, the social worker, and the spiritual care coordinator. And we have meetings. We talk all the time, and we and and in our meetings we we. We do our plans of cares. We identify the needs of the patients. And um, as a team, we um, discuss them when we come together. And that's the beauty. And I think that's what, what I love so much about the work that I do is that I don't have to do this by myself. Yeah. I My job is that entire 
person, they're spiritual, they're, they're physical, they're emotional. All of that is my responsibility, but I have people that help me do that because I'm not an expert in all of those things. I help coordinate the care and, um, and as a team, we're able to do this and we provide exceptional care. And, and most hospices are, are, are you know, this, I mean, people, you have very dedicated people that do this type of work. And yeah. so it's, it's beautiful work and it's not depressing. People always think, uh, you know, that's depressing work. It's beautiful. We're happy. And it's, it's just such a rewarding, rewarding field uh, to be in. It's, um, it's wonderful. Well, I, I don't think we could really wrap it at anything better than that. It was really well said. Uh, you're brilliant to have on. You're, uh, the perspectives that you shared with us, super helpful, especially for family caregivers. Uh, I think you had, you had a great perspective there. And oftentimes, they get left out in the conversations and the prep up from all of that. And that can, that can make us sometimes be more of a problem than a benefit to the situation. So we really appreciate the time that you took to, to walk us through that. And just in general, for my family, on behalf of my family as well, but but for all of our membership here, I just really appreciate you sharing your time, your talents, and your treasures. Thanks, Ernie. Yeah, I, it, was, it was a pleasure being here. So thank you. Thanks. Well, that's it for the team this week. And thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed the content, remember to subscribe and to share this episode on the app that you're using right now. Your reviews and your comments, they really help us expand our reach as well as our perspective. So if you have time, also drop us a note. Let us know how we're doing. For tips and tools to clarify your parent project, simplify communication with your stakeholders, and verify the professionals that you choose, you can find us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for trusting us until our next episode. Behold and be held. Thank you for listening to this Parent Projects podcast production. To access our show notes, resources, or forums, join us on your favorite social media platform or go to parentprojects.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Family Media and Technology Group Incorporated and Parent Projects LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcast.